So if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and open them up to the book of Romans, chapter 4. We're continuing in chapter 4, which we started last week. Romans chapter 4. And we're going to talk about the promise, the promise that God gave to Abram slash Abraham, and how it relates to the law. So we've been talking about the law off and on for a while because Paul talks about the law in the book of Romans quite a bit. And we've talked about how the law is good. We've talked about how God gave it to the people that he formed for their good. For, because it's a self-revelation of who he is and of what he expects of people, particularly his people. But we've also looked at the fact that we don't have an ability to keep the law, to obey the law as God would intend for us. So it's, it's good, but it also serves as a, a bit of a, a razor to do surgery on us. And sometimes that surgery can be quite painful when we encounter the law and realize that we cannot do what we ought to do in order to please God in accordance with his ways. So the law is beautiful, the law is good, the law is wonderful, but the law is also a bit of a problem for us. Because what the law does is that it shows us that we do not meet the standard of God as we should. And therefore that puts us in an, a hostile position toward God because of our brokenness, because of our sinfulness, because of our antagonistic nature toward God. That puts us in an awkward position regarding God. So something had to be done. And of course, we examined what that was. Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law completely on our behalf. He went to the cross as a perfect law keeper. He kept the law on my behalf and on yours. He died and took upon himself our sin and put upon us his righteousness or his right standing before God. So it was, that's the great exchange. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. And so we've explored that. But now he's going to talk about this other part that fits into the discussion of who we are as the people of God. And that's something that predates the law. And it's called the promise. Because before God ever gave the law, he gave a promise. And we'll examine to whom he gave that promise and what that promise is. And our big idea for today is this. Paul contrasts the law that he, that's God, not Paul. Paul contrasts the law that God required of his people with the promise he gave to Abraham. There's going to be an interesting interplay. So it's like the, the question that gets risen out of this is, well, God gave this promise, but then he also gave the law, and the law and the promise seem to be somewhat at odds with one another. So how does that work? So we're going to examine these things and try to come to an understanding of all of this. So we're going to begin with Romans chapter 4, verse 13 to start. Romans chapter 4 starting in verse 13. And it says this, For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For the promise that Abraham... For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So let's talk about this thing, because the promise is sort of prominent, especially in the early part of the Old Testament. But Paul is going to highlight for us how it's absolutely essential for us to understand what the heck he's talking about when he says this phrase, the promise. So that's our first fill in the blank. To what is Paul referring when he uses the phrase, the promise? So your first fill in the blank is the word promise. So to understand what he's getting at, we have to define our terms. 
right? It's always a good idea to define your terms. So if you're going to have a discussion on something or a learning moment about something, you have to actually know what it is specifically you're talking about. So what is the promise is our question. Well, we're going to go back and look in the Old Testament and see exactly what the promise is. Now, under this main point number one, I actually have three additional fill in the blanks on your notes. So we're going to answer those by looking at three passages from the book of Genesis. So the first one is in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who blesses you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, this is a great encapsulation of the promise, and your fill-in-the-blank is at the top there. The first thing I want to highlight is that God promised to bless Abram with a land. He gave Abram a place, right? We can't do stuff without a place to do it at or from, right? How many of you have a hobby? All of, several of you have a hobby. Some of you apparently have hobbies you don't want to admit to. All right. <laughs> do you do that hobby solely in your mind? No. You do that hobby in a place. If you do woodworking, you have a woodworking bench, right? If you fix cars, you have a garage. If you read, you have anywhere, right? <laughs> That's my plug for reading. Yeah, so you, you need a place to begin. And so part of the promise that God gave to Abraham first is a land. He gave a land, and he gave him a land, not just a small singular location, because the promise has to do with more than just something that Abram would tool around with in one tiny location. This was going to be a big promise, so it required a big place to do it in and to do it from. So God promised first to bless Abram with a land, but he doesn't stop there. Number two, God promised to bless Abram with a family, with a family. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. This is the people of God in both the Old and the New Testaments, respectively, that God is referring to. He says, you, I've given you a land, but I'm not, you're not just going to be there kind of hanging out by yourself. Right? And I know you've got servants, and I know you've got a wife, and I know you've got camels, and I know you've got all sorts of other things, but what you don't have, Abram, is you don't have a family. And so, one of the chief elements of the promise is that, Abram, you're going to have children. You're going to have a family. You're going to have not just a land to do the promise in and from, but you're going to have a family to do the promise with. You're not going to be alone. So God blessed Abram with a people. He creates from Abram, when he changes him to Abraham, he creates from him an entire nation. And more than just a nation. All right? And we'll get to there too. So that's Genesis 15. And then Genesis 17, 
1 through 8, God promised to bless Abraham with himself, with God. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless that I may take, make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. That's what Abraham means. I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make you into nations and kings shall come from you and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be there. God. So what does God give Abram, Abraham? A living relationship and a direct connection to the living God. He promises to Abram and Abra Abraham, when he becomes Abraham, he promises to him, you get to have a direct connection and relationship personally with me. So there are these three elements to the promise, at least. The land, the family, and God himself. Now, Abram has none of these things before he covenants with God, before he has interaction with God, which means God is absolutely the key to all of this for him. So this is the promise. He says to Abram, look, this, you're, we're starting small, right? This is how God does it always, right? You look at the parable of the mustard seed, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It's the smallest of all of the seeds, but... It grows and becomes larger than all of the garden plants, right? And the birds of the heavens take nest in it, which is actually a reference to, I believe, Ezekiel, where the birds represent the other nations coming and then having um, benefit from the kingdom of God. Okay, so it starts as, a, you know, the thing about seeds is that the DNA of the plant is located in that tiny little seed. Everything that that plant will become is located in that seed. And this promise is like a bit of a seed. The promise is like a seed where it seems so small to begin with because he starts with just this elderly fellow who is long past childbearing years and his wife is barren and long past childbearing years. And God says, I've got an idea. <laughs> We're going to do some interesting things here, Abram. And you're going to have to come with me on this. And the, kind of one of the key things that we saw here is this phrase in Genesis 15. Let me jump back there. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. This is the key to understanding what he means when he talks about the promise. And the, I guess you would say the activation of the promise. It's activated on account of the faith that Abram shows God. That's where we have to go. That's what we have to understand. And so God promises these things. So when we talk about the promise, what does this promise have to do with our salvation? So, Paul, why are you bringing this up? What does this have to, how does this figure in to all of these things that you've been talking about, Paul, up until this point, about how we can't have a relationship with God until something happens, that God acts on our behalf, and of course he sends Jesus Christ and all of that. How does this discussion of the promise fit with that? Here's the thing, without redemption from personal and corporate sin, we cannot inherit what God has promised. Here's the idea, and here's, I think, a bit of the problem. When we talk about salvation, we think too small. We think about what happens to my soul personally, and we stop there. Wrong. That's just the starting point of this whole discussion. 
Because apart from the redemption of sinful souls, we not only can't be saved, which is true, but we also can't inherit the blessing God intends to give to His people. Here's the thing. We talked last week about this, about Abraham. And we remember that song we learned as kids, right? Father Abraham had lots of kids, had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Hey, we learned that song. What is that song? Where does that come from? It comes from here and in Galatians. You're a child of Abraham. This is part of what Paul is driving at. That this isn't just about, hey, what happens to the location of my soul after I die? That is a fraction of the discussion of salvation. It has to do with how are we made fit to inherit the promise that God gave all the way back to Abraham in Genesis 12 and 15 and 17. When we talk about salvation, we're not just talking about, I get to go to heaven when I die. That is like talking about standing in line at Disney World. You're in Disney World, and that's great, and you're standing in line, which is a little like, okay, but I'm waiting. Right? It's, it's a, so when you go to heaven when you die, by the way, that's what we as theologians refer to as the intermediate state. That's not the final state. That's not the final condition. Going to heaven when you die is awesome. But it's not the end of the story. We talk about life after death, and one theologian likes to talk about life after, life after death, which is resurrection. It's not just I get to be up in the clouds or in the, the heavenly kind of spiritual place, but it's when God finally comes, rest, returns and restores, remakes, resurrects essentially the entire created order. He gives us a place to live, which sounds a little familiar when you look at the promise to Abraham. He promised a place. He promised a place. Now, it's interesting in the, the place side of things, he says in Genesis, I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to give you a land, which is fairly, it's bigger than just, you know, a house, obviously, right? But it's also smaller than the rest of the world. When Paul talks about that passage, he, he talks about inheriting the world, it talks about inheriting the world. And so the promise was never meant to be singly and solely located just in one particular sliver of land that's not a whole lot bigger than Rhode Island. Right? When he's talking about the nation of Israel, he's talking about a starting point for growth. Go read uh, Daniel chapter 2, the prophecy that God essentially gave to King Nebuchadnezzar, and he had Daniel interpret in the dream for him. He talks about a kingdom that will come and destroy all the other kingdoms, and it will overtake the rest of the world. So he has given us a place, and it's yet to come. It's yet to come. So without redemption from personal and corporate sin, we cannot inherit the world God prepared for us, become the family of God, and have a living relationship with God. All of those elements of the promise apply to you and to me. We haven't seen all of them yet. Like, for example, that first one, the world. It's yet to come. That's why sometimes we refer to it as the world to come. The world that is not yet. The place that isn't quite. And it's the same, it's the same planet, everybody. It's just that, just like in the resurrection of Christ, God used up the material of the resurrection uh, of, of, of his old body to do the new body. Same thing is true of the entire created order. The material of this world gets used up in the new creation. It just gets resurrected, just like Christ was resurrected. So just like Christ is a little bit different after the resurrection in a handful of ways, like not everybody recognizes him right away. Right? You know, he walks through locked doors and stuff. It's a little weird, but all right. But he still, he still does physical things. He still like eats broiled fish on the beach with his disciples. He's physical, and it's transformed physicality. But this is all promise, and it's all part and parcel of the discussion of who we are today as the people of God and what we will become.
So when we talk about the promise, it absolutely applies to you and I today. Number two, it is impossible to lay claim to the promise by merit through keeping God's perfect law. It is impossible to lay claim to the promise by merit through keeping God's perfect law. So now he's going to do a contrast with the law. Romans chapter 4, verse 14. Romans chapter 4, verse 14. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. He says it cannot be the adherents of the law, the people who try their hardest or their darndest to obey or perfectly keep the law. Well, why not? Well, there are reasons. So let's go ahead and look at those reasons. So he says, for if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs. Sorry, hypothetical situation. If, what if obeying the law was the requirement? Let's look at it as if you're like looking at a photo negative and look at it from the other way. What if obeying the law was the requirement? Well, he's already established the impossibility of that. It's bad news. Do you remember, were you here for bad news Sunday? We, talk, we joked about that a little bit. Before we get to the good news of Jesus Christ, we necessarily have to encounter the bad news. The bad news is that I am born broken and sinful and dead by my nature apart from a regenerating work of God. I am born hostile to God. That's who I am by nature. Unless God acts upon me in a certain way, I'm out. Because I have no hope of keeping God's perfect law. So, that's part of the answer to this equation, or part of the answer of this problem. Why is it that the, keeping the law is not the requirement? Because we can't. We can't do that. As good as the law is, we are not. The law is way up here and we're way down farther there than I can reach. That's who we are as a people, apart from God's saving work. Apart from God doing something to save us. For if, the, if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, then it's a problem. Because we can't. So then he says, for if that's the, the case, then faith is null. Faith is null. If inheritance of God's promise were conditioned on obedience to the law, then faith is canceled out. Because you're dealing with a different standard than the standard that God gave us of faith to receive the promise. Right? This is how God actually does it. Right? He actually does it by grace, through faith, plus nothing else. By grace, through faith, plus nothing else. That plus nothing else is what erases the possibility of the law being part of the equation of our salvation. By grace, through faith. It's not by grace through faith and a little bit of the law. It's not by grace through faith and the entirety of the law. It's by grace through faith, period, end of the sentence. Because otherwise, you and I are in trouble. Big trouble. Because we can't do it. We haven't the ability. God gave the law, which was good and perfect and true, and he gave it to a people. And that people said, sweet. And they ran with it, and it didn't go well. And they tried for ages. And what eventually ended up happening is that the law got abandoned, and it got replaced with idolatry. The people of God during the Old Testament said, this is hard. But there's this God, Molech, and all he wants is our firstborn. Or there's this God, Baal, and he wants some of our crops and he wants us to slaughter some people. So that, we can do that. 
as bloody as it may be, we can do that. There's this god Ashtara, and we've got these poles that we put up, and they're a little funky, but we'll worship there, and we can do that. There are these moments of accusation in the Old Testament where God is fed up with his people because they're running after other gods. Or they claim to be trying to worship God and they're mixing in other things from other nations. Or they're claiming to be following God and they're just frankly not because they can't do it. They don't have the ability. And neither do we apart from God's regenerating work. So if it is the adherents of the law who are to be heirs, faith is null. Which means I don't care how much faith you think you have. If you're required to obey the law, that faith doesn't count for a thing. Because you can't keep the law to begin with. Faith is null and the promise is void. If faith counted for nothing because of the legal requirement, then so does this promise. The land, the family, and God himself are unattainable if we are required first to follow the law. This is why he made him, Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. He took our sin upon himself at the cross that we might become the righteousness of God, that we might have the righteousness of God counted to our account on account of faith. By placing our faith in Jesus Christ, his righteousness is credited to our account and the promise is accessible. Not because we followed the law, but because he did. Now, that doesn't mean we chuck the law because somebody else took care of it for us. The law is still good. But it's just that we don't put the cart before the horse and try to do the law thing before we do the salvation thing. The law, we've talked about this. We talked about how good the law is and how for us, even today, the law is for us. And it's good and there is benefit to it. But there are elements, of course, to it that we don't do, like the sacrificial system. Why? Because Jesus was the perfect sacrifice? Because all of that stuff in the Old Testament was a shadow pointing to Jesus Christ on the cross? And that when he went to the cross, he fulfilled in complete that requirement on our behalf. So we don't have to go to a temple and slit the throat of a sheep. Because it is perpetually and continually being fulfilled for us right at this moment. It's not just a, it happened in the past and we're good. It's that that past sacrifice has a perpetual future continuing effect. It is ongoing. That sacrifice is eternal in nature and takes care of all of that stuff for us. Right? And there are other things that we could talk about, other examples, but that's the, like the most obvious one. So it's impossible to lay claim to the promise by merit through keeping God's perfect law. And then lastly, number three, the law cannot function as a path to the promise because it is only a path to God's wrath for sinners. We're back to that bad news part of things. The law cannot function as a path to the promise because it is only a path to God's wrath for sinners. And that's everybody's starting point. And if that's everybody's starting point, no matter how good the law is, and it's perfect because it is, a, it is God's self-expression of his character and nature, no matter how good the law is, we can't reach it. We can't attain it. And therefore, the effect is it's only possible to produce the wrath of God on behalf of sinners. This is what it says in Romans 4.15. For the law brings wrath. But where there is no law, there is no transgression. <laughs> 
for there is no wrath, or for, uh, rather, uh, for the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. So, first and foremost, for the law brings wrath. One function of the law is to reveal the depth of sin. That's what the law does. It shows us our problem in detail. It reveals for us the precise nature of our problems, or of our problem. It does so via things like statutes and ordinances, the breaking of which are called transgressions, which is the word he uses here for a very specific reason, and we'll get there in a second. But this is the problem with the law being used as a path to the promise. It highlights and shows for us how off we are and how unable we are to reach that because we are constantly, as human beings, born broken and bent away from God by nature, transgressing His perfect law. Doesn't that make you feel so good inside? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's good to know it to start with. Transgressing the law of God is a direct affront to God himself and justly merits his wrath. Here's the thing about God. He has no flaw. He's perfect in all of his ways. He is without sin. He is without flaw. He is without problem. He is holy, righteous, and just. And for a people who are not, that presents a problem. Because it means we justly, directly deserve and merit His wrath on account of it. This is why interacting with the law cannot merit the promise and salvation. Because we, are, we sinfully fail, we merit wrath. That's humanity's default position from the instant you draw your first breath. From even before that, from eternity past, when you existed only in the mind of God, He knew where this was going. He ordained where this was going. And He ordained the solution to it. But then he says this fascinating thing, where there is no law, there's no transgression. He doesn't say there's no sin. He says there's no transgression, which is a specific thing to do with the legal statutes and ordinances of the law. Right? Because think about this. Cain and Abel predate the law. Cain kills Abel. God calls it a sin. He hasn't given the law. So there's no transgression of the revealed law. It's still sin. It's still a problem. It's not like he could just say, oh, I'm going to yank the law out of the way and that'll take care of everything. That's not how that works because the problem is still there whether the law is there to reveal it specifically or not. Right? Right? So, this is what's going on. He's building up this, this advocating moment for salvation by grace through faith, not the law. And he's doing so by relying on the promise. Because the promise predates the law. The promise is given before Mount Sinai and the giving of the covenant to the people of Israel. And there's this thing called the promise and it predates the law. The promise predates the giving of the law and therefore specific law transgressions aren't actually the issue. The root problem of sin is the issue. Ignoring the promise and focusing on the law gets us lost in the weeds of legal detail. The law is still good, and it's still there for study, it's still there for examination, it's still there for application after salvation, not before.
Because before, what we need is salvation by grace through faith plus nothing. So he's, he's appealing to the promise previous to the law as the solution to the actual problem. The law doesn't deal with the actual problem. The law just shows it in its fullness. The promise is given to be the beginning working point on the problem. God gave us Adam, who messed things up. And then he gave us Abraham as the beginning point for the solution to the problem of Adam, who we are all in from birth. And then God gave us Jesus Christ, whom if we are in Christ by faith, he gives us grace and eternal life and salvation and all the elements of the promise. This is why Paul talks about the promise. He talks about the promise because it's the founding and starting point for the solution of God. The law isn't. The law is there as a necessary part to show what the problem is. But the solution began before the law ever showed up. Because God was working on the solution before he gave the law. God was working on the solution before he made anything. You realize that? This is all his show, people. This is all on him. And he's called us and invited us into this. He's given us the, the Savior that we need, that we require. But he's the one who works it all out. For God works all things together for the good of those who love him and were called according to his purpose. Spoiler alert on Romans chapter 8. We haven't gotten there yet. But that's what it says. God works all things together for the good. It doesn't say all things are good. It just says that's how he works them. That's how he works them. That's his sovereign ability and plan at work. And you and I are a part of it. Because he is good. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the promise. Thank you for grace. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for faith. We pray, Father, that we would be people trusting wholly and fully in you and sharing the gospel with our neighbors, with our friends, with our co-workers, with people we know, with people we don't, maybe, so that they, too, might enter the kingdom by grace through faith and become heirs of the promise. Thank you, God, for all of this. We pray all of this in your name. Amen.